Welcome to AI Business TV here at the AI Summit San Francisco 2019. Uh, we're very pleased to have with us today Rashid Haq, who is the Global Head of AI and Data at Publicis Sapient. How are you doing today? Very good. Fantastic. So, yeah, welcome to the AI Summit. Thank you. Uh, you delivered a keynote presentation yesterday. Did, um, yes. It was around leveraging AI technologies to succeed in retail. Yep. For those that were in attendance yesterday, can you tell us a, a, a few points and, and key takeaways from the session? Yeah, so AI can be used across the entire retail uh, business, uh, everything that's engaging with the customer in operations and the supply chain. And some of the uh, points I was making, I was giving examples of uh, how businesses are using it uh, across the board and the advantage of using it more broadly uh, across the business rather than within each of the uh, departments. Because if you look at uh, what's going on in marketing and then what happens in the e-commerce channel, uh, some of the data and many of the algorithms uh, can be reused. Uh, so, so integrating those on a single platform makes sense. And now we're also seeing that some of that data being used inside of the supply chain. So if you build the supply chain uh, demand forecasting models, uh, if you look at the demand forecasting models within the supply chain, uh, they're built on historical data, historical sales data. Mm -hmm. But if you add historical sales plus the clickstream data and the search data from the e-commerce site, and what the customers are doing, the accuracy uh, improves significantly. So being able to use uh, AI across all of those both uh, improves the quality of the results, the performance of the business, and the advantage is you have a shared data platform and a shared AI platform, uh, which reduces the cost. Fantastic. Have you seen any examples of this um, You know, in real life, how this is being implemented today? Any key use cases around the world for this? Yeah, there, there are quite a few. So I would say probably about uh, 10 to 15 percent of uh, retail businesses are doing this uh, in some form or other. They're at various stages of uh, of the transformation for themselves. So uh, if you look at, for example, some companies where they're using uh, data that they're collecting from the clickstream uh, on their e-commerce, plus data they've collected from ad impressions that they copy over to the uh, to the same uh, connected database, mm. and also data that they're connecting from in-store. So, for example, if you're uh, if you have Wi-Fi and a customer connects uh, or a prospect connects to the Wi-Fi, uh, you have their device ID and you know wh where their uh, what their behaviors are in-store. So, if you collect all of those together, uh, we were working with a, a company where we increased their. Uh, uh, customer acquisition from digital ads from 2% conversion to over 6% conversion. And the uh, cost of the uh, marketing dollars went down by 43% because they didn't have to blanket target people they could uh, very specifically target. target. Yeah. Phenomenal. And, and there are examples in, in the supply chain, like the example I was giving with uh, using the historical sales data plus uh, the clickstream and search data. Uh, for another company, we improved the uh, accuracy by close to 82% for the demand forecast, or reduced the error rate by close to 82%. Phenomenal. So let's take this back then to the strategy piece. So how are we seeing AI being kind of included um, and underpinning digital transformation strategies today? And like, how vital is it really right, right now in 2019 to enterprises? Yeah, that's a great question. And you know, when companies are uh, thinking about digital transformation, what we're seeing is one of the big pillars underneath that is uh, AI. And most of the leading companies today are tr uh, transforming themselves into data-driven companies. And uh, the main way that data is utilized is through AI. So, so it's a big component, and they're doing uh, doing that across not just retail, but uh, almost every uh, every uh, industry. Phenomenal. And in terms of kind of skills acquisition, keeping skills within the company, or outsourcing, it seems to be one versus the other. There's a big conversation um, across all our stages here around you know do we do it in house? Do we outsource to experts? The pros and cons bet between the two. Yeah. What's your response on this? Yeah, I think my feeling is that it's a false choice because, you know, Bill uh, Bill Joy famously said that 
no matter how many smart people you have inside the company, there are more smart, smart people outside of your company. And if you try to choose one or the other, there are big downsides to, to both. So it's, uh, it's ideal to do both uh, at the same time. So you do have to build your team internally, but particularly the decision-making components uh, you want to keep in-house. You want to bring partners from outside, whether those are uh, consulting companies like ourselves or uh, startups that, or startups or other companies that have some of the products uh, that you can use and integrate into your API, and and you can also build your models uh, on on your own. Right? But there's no reason to build something if somebody has already built it and you can use it as an API. Sure, sure. And and obviously um, remaining transparent and being you know having AI explainable within the enterprises is quite important as well. It's a, it's a massive talking point. Um, how how kind of vital is it for for enterprises to 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 kind of um, push this this point? Or is it a bit of a, a mute point at the moment? No, I, I think it's actually really uh, important. So both the, the transfer, transparency and uh, reducing bias in AI systems and, uh, and, and the interpretability. So, mm -hmm. so I'll give you a couple of uh, examples. We were working with one company where we were uh, trying to automate the loan approval process using a uh, machine learning algorithm. And if you put in uh, all the historical data uh, and then ask it to predict on historical data that it hasn't seen, we, we were getting extremely high accuracy. But then if you test it for bias, it's also uh, very biased. And we, we were particularly looking at gender bias. And then we went back to the source data and we looked at just the data itself. And we said, if we, rem if we remove the gender uh, with just the remaining data of their application information and whether they were approved or rejected, we could predict the gender of the uh, applicant with 82% accuracy. And the reason it's not 50 and 82 is because there is bias in the data. Yeah. And then, uh, so then you have to do data transformation and data augmentation uh, even before you start modeling to remove that bias. Otherwise, that'll get uh, embedded throughout the process. And then when you're doing the modeling itself, usually machine learning and deep learning, what you're optimizing for is the lowest error. So that's what the algorithm is looking for. What's the best data fit with the lowest error? But in, in uh, these situations, you have to say, I want lowest error plus lowest bias so that those two together is minimized. Otherwise, bias will creep back in right. even if it's not in the data because just to increase uh, accuracy and then you still have to test it so that's that's one example and the other example uh, or the other issue is interpretability and what when when an algorithm makes a decision it's usually a black box uh, some, sometimes it's interpretable uh, but often it's not and there's no agreement in in the uh, applied AI community or even in the research community about what interpretability means. Because if you ask a data scientist, they can say, well, it came up with this answer because these nodes in the, uh, in the neural network have these weights, and these weights came because of this data. But that's not uh, useful from a, a business decision-making perspective. And so the way we look at it is how to make uh, interpretability is how to make the uh, outcome intuitive to the uh, user, to a business user, and can they can it inform their intuition so that they can uh, augment each other in the decision making process, and uh, and and then obviously there are regulatory implications also beyond just building uh, business intuition. So like GDPR in California, CCPA that will come online next year. Mm -hmm. Uh, those require uh, uh, algorithmic interpretability, uh, especially when engaging with uh, customers. Fantastic. So, uh, final question is AI hype, AI reality. Where are we on that spectrum at the moment? Are we still on the hype curve? And how do we separate the, the hype from reality? If, if people are, are, are greeted with an AI product, how, how can they see through and, and kind of you know, drill down whether this, this, is, this is hype or if this is AI in action? Yeah, that's a great question, and uh, it's. I, I think both uh, exist simultaneously right now and may for some time. So, 
uh, if you look at, you know, one of the things I was talking in my uh, keynote yesterday is how much uh, AI has improved over the last uh, seven years. Between 2012 and now, uh, the, uh, the capability of AI has improved 300,000 fold. Right? And that's when you put it next to Moore's law, Moore's law looks like a flat line. And uh, so that kind of capability uh, needs to be acknowledged that now you can do a lot, a uh, lot with that. But on the other hand, there are also many, uh, many talks and discussions about the uh, about AI that are that are completely high. And one of the things, so the first piece uh, to be able to do to separate hype and reality is just uh, ramp up on how, uh, even at a high level, how the uh, AI modeling works. And, uh, and I actually have a book coming out for uh, enterprise AI transformation where I spend quite a bit of time explaining that and how, how decision making should work mm -hmm. using uh, AI. So if you look at how AI gets used, some of it is around uh, automation of actions. And th those are mostly possible today. Uh, the majority of the applications are around uh, learning. So you collect uh, uh, patterns from data so that when new data comes in you can make accurate predictions so that's the learning aspect that that part works very well but when you start to see AI that looks like it's doing reasoning or uh, uh, you know causal inference that this happened so that's going to happen uh, there is no AI today that that has that capability right except for smart uh, or expert systems sure. Uh, where those rules are hand coded, but uh, if you look at deep learning, machine learning, or the other other types of AI, uh, we're nowhere close to uh, reasoning. So that that's another very quick way to see uh, to what's yeah, to, sure. to distinguish between hype and reality. Fantastic! Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, enjoy the rest of your AI summit. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye.